Okay, let's talk about heat. The first question that we have to answer is, how do we heat up? We heat up two ways. We heat up from the outside and we heat up from the inside. The simplest way to think about this is that we actually have two body temperatures. Body temperature varies between individuals. It varies across time of day within individuals. And at every point across your entire lifespan, you have two distinct temperatures. One is the temperature on your skin, what scientists call your shell, and the temperature of your core, your viscera, meaning your organs, your nervous system, and your spinal cord. And as you can imagine, the temperature of your core is always higher than the temperature at your surface. Your brain has neurons that send signals to other cells in your body and deploy the release of chemicals in your brain and body to heat you up when you are too cold and to cool you down when you are too hot. One way that you can heat up is by cooling down the surface of your body. That's right. If I were to throw a cold towel, ice cold towel onto your torso right now and ask you, well, how do you feel? You'd say, oh, that's cold, that's chilly. However, because your brain is acting like a bit of a thermostat as the surface, the shell of your body felt cool, it would make sense that that thermostat would activate biological mechanisms that would heat up your core. So anytime we're talking about heat, meaning deliberate heat exposure, things like sauna, it's very important to understand not just the stimulus, how hot something is, how long you're in a sauna, et cetera, but the effect that has on your shell and on your core. If you can understand that, you can design protocols that are literally perfect for your goal. Everything in biology is a process. So as you'll soon learn, there is a specific sauna protocol that can allow you, can allow anybody in fact, to increase the amount of growth hormone released into their brain and body 16 fold. That's right, 16 fold. So today you're gonna to learn about the use of sauna. You're gonna learn about the use of other heat related tools for health and optimization, not just for growth hormone, but also metabolic health for controlling cortisol, even to impact mental health in positive ways. In order to do that, you need to understand a little bit about the mechanisms of how you heat up and how you cool down. I promise to make the description of that, which follows very clear, even if you don't have a background in biology. And once you have that in hand, then you will be in the best possible position to use sauna or hot tub or other tools, even just a hot shower as a powerful stimulus to optimize your biology. A brief warning now and another brief warning later, anytime you're talking about heating up your body, you need to be very cautious because unlike cooling down where you have a fairly broad range of cold temperatures that you can go into before it's damaging to tissue, well, you don't get to heat up the brain and body very much before you start getting into the realm of neuron damage. And neurons in the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, once they're damaged, they don't come back. So hyperthermia is a serious thing to avoid. Later, I'll talk about ways to rapidly protect against hyperthermia. So now let's talk about what are the circuits for heating up? How does it happen? What happens when you go into a cold environment and you're shivering, but you put on a coat and then you feel warmer. What's really going on there? Well, there's a very basic circuit, meaning neurons that exist in the skin, in the brain and in the body that communicate with one another that allow you to heat up if you need to and cool down if you need to. So here's how this circuit is structured. You have this shell, which is basically skin. And within the skin, you have neurons, nerve cells. Those nerve cells have channels or receptors which basically sense changes in heat. For instance, if I were to put a hot object on your hand or arm and then remove that hot object, those neurons would respond to that. They would send electrical signals into your spinal cord. And that's where the next station of the circuit resides. And those neurons specifically relay heat information up to another area of your brain, lateral parabrachial area. You don't need to know, but it's a relay station. The lateral parabrachial, area sends electrical signals to the POA. And I would like you to know POA. The POA stands for pre-optic area. Neurons in the pre-optic area basically reside over the roof of your mouth. These are neurons within the hypothalamus and have the ability to send signals out to the rest of your brain and body to get you to heat up and actually to change your behavior so that you heat up. Believe it or not, your POA, your preoptic area, will actually change the way that you think and feel immediately. If something warm contacts your skin or something very hot contacts your skin, the preoptic area will send signals out to the endothelial cells 
the blood vessels, both of the brain and body, that get them to dilate in order to cast off heat. You will also start sweating. That sweating response is initiated not by the hot day or the hot sun, but by the preoptic area neurons that send signals out to what's called the periphery of your body. And other chemicals are released, things like acetylcholine, that get you to sweat. So there are all these different mechanisms by which we dump heat. And the lethargy, the kind of tiredness that we feel on a really hot day, that's also controlled by this circuit that I just described. Another key thing to understand about this circuit related to heat is that the preoptic area also can send electrical signals to the amygdala, a brain area that is often talked about in the context of fear, but is really just a brain area that can activate your sympathetic nervous system. If you ever have gotten into a sauna that was very, very hot, maybe 210 degrees Fahrenheit, you sit there for a minute, you'll notice that your heart rate increases and there are reasons for that. And we'll talk about some of the health benefits of that in a few minutes. You may not feel like your skin is gonna burn up, but you often will feel the impulse to get out, especially if you stay in there for a little while. That impulse is the consequence of this pre-optic area communicating with your amygdala saying, hey, this environment is really hot and I'm trying to cool down and it's not really working. I'm dumping heat, but I'm not able to adjust the core of my body temperature in ways that are going to protect my neurons. And so it's a signal that you probably shouldn't stay in that environment too long. So now you know the circuit. Again, it's simple. It goes from skin to spinal cord, one brain area to another brain area. That's the key one in this discussion, which is the POA, the preoptic area. And the preoptic area can kick off a bunch of autonomic subconscious responses to heat, which make us attempt to get cooler, things like sweating, vasodilation, et cetera and it can kick off behavioral responses, spreading out our limbs in an attempt to dump even more heat, feeling lethargic, so a lack of desire to run and move. And it also has the opportunity to kick off a mild or maybe not so mild panic response to get us out of that hot environment. Next, I'd like to talk about the use of deliberate heat exposure, including sauna, but other tools as well. But first I'd like to just emphasize that the use of deliberate heat exposure can be a very powerful way to improve health and longevity. There's a wonderful study on this that was published in 2018 that includes a lot of data from a lot of participants in a lot of different conditions. This is one of several papers that clearly demonstrate that regular use of sauna or other forms of deliberate heat exposure can reduce mortality to cardiovascular events, but also to other events, things like stroke and other things that basically can kill us. And basically what they found was the more often that people do sauna, the better their health is and the lower the likelihood they will die from some sort of cardiovascular event. Now, what do we mean by sauna? We need to define some of the parameters around sauna. And I promise to provide you some alternative ways to access some of the health benefits that were observed in this and related studies without the need to have a sauna. Cause I do realize that a lot of people don't have access to sauna. First off, the temperature ranges that were used in this study and pretty much all the studies that I'm going to talk about are between 80 degrees Celsius, meaning 176 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 degrees Celsius, meaning 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So somewhere in that range. How hot should you make the sauna or the environment that you get into should you decide to use these tools? Well, that will depend on your tolerance for heat, how heat adapted you are. Yes, some people are better at sweating than others. And over time, we all get better at sweating. Meaning if you go into the sauna more frequently, you become a better sweater. Not a sweater you wear, but the verb sweater. You get better at sweating, at dumping heat through the loss of water. And I recommend starting on the lower end of the temperature scale and if that's too hot for you, that you even lower the temperature further. Now, how long were people exposing themselves to these hot environments? Anywhere from five to 20 minutes per session. In this particular study, they compared the effects of people that did sauna once a week, two or three times per week, or four to seven times per week. And what they saw was really remarkable. People who went into the sauna two or three times per week were 27% less likely to die of a cardiovascular event than people that went into the sauna just once a week. And in fact, the benefits were even greater for people that were going into the sauna four to seven times per week. Those people were 50% less likely to die of a cardiovascular event compared to people that went into the sauna just once a week. I want to just 
talk about the use of sauna as a tool and emphasize that you don't have to use a sauna in order to get these benefits. It is simply a matter of making sure that your shell and your core heat up properly a bit, not too much, not too little. So just to be clear, the temperature range is important. You wanna get between 80 and 100 degrees Celsius. Now you know the conversion to Fahrenheit. You could, however, immerse yourself in a hot tub or hot water bath up to your neck. That's another way to approach it. If you didn't have access to either of those, you could also put on a, a hoodie or a wool hat and a hoodie, or you could do like the wrestlers do, and you could actually buy one of these uh, plastic suits. All of those will increase your shell and your core body temperature, right? Especially if you do it on a hot day, but of course be careful, hydrate and don't overheat. Don't become excessively hyperthermic because you can get heat stroke and you can potentially die. But if you're going to use sauna, often I get the question, how hot should the sauna be? Well, now you know. How long should you be in there? Five to 20 minutes per session. Although I will talk in a minute about ways to optimize hormone output, in particular growth hormone output. And of course you have to ask yourself, wet sauna, dry sauna. You know what? Doesn't matter. Use what you prefer. Many people ask me, well, what about infrared sauna? My understanding, or at least my assessment of most infrared saunas out there is that they don't get hot enough. They don't get up to that 80 to 100 degrees Celsius range. Some do, most don't. Now I'd like to talk about the use of sauna to increase growth hormone. Growth hormone impacts metabolism and growth of cells and tissues of the body. It is responsible for tissue repair as well. And the growth spurt that everyone experiences during puberty is the consequence of growth hormone. What I'm about to describe is a study that found dramatic, really dramatic, I should say, increases in growth hormone. Normally, we would release growth hormone every night after we go to sleep, in particular in the early part of the night when our sleep is comprised mostly of slow wave sleep. As we age, less growth hormone is released during that slow wave sleep. Certain forms of deliberate heat exposure using sauna can stimulate very large increases in growth hormone output, which for people in their 30s, 40s, and beyond could be very useful and may also be useful for people who are just trying to stimulate the release of more growth hormone in order to, for instance, recover from exercise or stimulate fat loss or muscle growth or repair of a particular injury. This is a paper that was published in 1986, which is some years ago, but nonetheless serves as a basis for a lot of other studies that followed. So let me describe what they did in this study. They used an 80 degree Celsius environment. So that's 176 degrees Fahrenheit. And they had subjects do this sauna for 30 minutes, four times per day. So that's two hours total in one day. But what they observed was really quite significant. So they had subjects do this protocol. And I should mention they had both male and female subjects in this study. And the entire study lasted a week. And they measured a lot of different hormones, cortisol, thyroid stimulating hormone, thyroid hormone itself, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. They looked at prolactin and they looked at growth hormone. In subjects that did this two hour a day, 80 degree Celsius protocol, experienced 16 fold increases in growth hormone. So they measured growth hormone before the sauna and after the sauna and growth hormone levels went up 16 fold. Remember earlier when I talked about people who did sauna once a week versus two to three times a week versus four to seven times a week. And the more often people did sauna, the less likely they were to die of cardiovascular events or other things of that sort. Well, in this case, the effects of sauna exposure on growth hormone actually went down the more often that people did this deliberate heat exposure. So as I mentioned, they did this two hour a day divided into 30 minute sessions protocol on day one, day three, and day seven of a week. And what they found was on day one, there was a 16 fold increase in growth hormone. On day three, however, there was still a significant effect on growth hormone as compared to before sauna, but that effect was basically cut by two thirds. And then on day seven, there tended to be a two, maybe a three fold increase, but not as great as the one observed on day one. The reason this happens is because heat just like cold, is a shock or a stressor to the system. So we have to imagine that when these subjects got into the sauna on day one, whatever pathways went from measurement of temperature at the shell 
to changes in temperature at the core led to these big increases in growth hormone, which is basically a way of just describing the result I already told you before. But the fact that that result diminished over time either means that the circuit was not as efficient in communicating that shift in temperature or that that shift in temperature was of less impact because the downstream effectors were not engaged to the same extent because it wasn't as much of a shock. One of the key things to understand about the use of deliberate heat exposure is if you're going to use it in order to try and trigger massive increases in growth hormone, you're going to need to be careful about not doing it more than let's say once a week. Now I'm extrapolating from this study, maybe once every 10 days would be even better. But if you start getting heat adapted, it's very unlikely that you're going to get these massive increases in growth hormone. So I don't mean to be discouraging of using deliberate heat exposure to access growth hormone increases, but if that's your specific goal or your main goal, then I think it's reasonable to say that you don't want to do deliberate heat exposure, at least not of the sort that I described here, more than once a week or maybe even once every 10 days and that you would want to time that to other events in your life, maybe hard workouts or if you're trying to push through a fat loss barrier or simply in order to access growth hormone at peak levels, maybe three times per month or four times per month. If you start doing deliberate heat exposure more often, you'll still get increases in growth hormone, but they are not going to be nearly as large as the increases in growth hormone that you're going to experience if you shock your system with deliberate heat exposure every once in a while. So just to briefly recap, if you want to get the greatest growth hormone increases, do sauna or other deliberate heat exposure fairly seldom, probably no more than once per week, maybe even less, and do it a lot that day. Just make sure that you break it up into multiple sessions. In the study I described earlier, they did four sessions, 30 minutes each a week. If you're interested in the cardiovascular benefits and the potential longevity benefits of sauna, well, then it's clear that doing it three to four, maybe even seven times per week is going to be more beneficial than doing it just one or three times per week. And again, that range of 80 to 100 degrees Celsius is going to be your guide. And in terms of timing, after a workout of any kind, morning or afternoon, or if you're not doing it after a workout, certainly in the later part of the day is going to be most beneficial as it relates to sleep. 